for the Public Library of Cincinnati and Hampton County. I am interviewing Bruce Richardson today on October 11, 2006 at the Main Library in Cincinnati. Our camera operator today is Doug McGee. Also present is Mr. Richardson's daughter, Peggy Jessica. Let's start off with finding out where you grew up. I grew up in Anderson Township. Like I said, it, off the Salem Pike, right out. It's east of, it was considered Cincinnati, part of it, Mount Washington, okay. There I was born and raised at, uh, uh, on Bruce Avenue, which my dad built the street. They didn't build the old house there on the corner, but that's where I was born. Everybody used to have their babies at home at that time, you know, years ago. So that's where I I went to this, and this, we built a house on down this road farther, uh, Bruce Avenue, and I went to service from there. Okay. I went into the, I sworn in on February 15th, 1943, but I went into active duty on the 22nd of February of 1943. So, in other words, I was sworn in down here on 4th Street, Cincinnati. They had an old warehouse building, the doctors checked you out and all this, this kind of stuff, and then we swore in from there. And, and I went to Fort Thomas from there, and then on into Miami Beach, but uh, that was in 1943. Well, to, which, which branch of the military is this? I'm in the Air Force. The Air Force? Air Force right from the start. Were you yeah. drafted or did you enlist? I was drafted, but, you know, I was on the verge of enlisted because uh, all my buddies had been already went. But I was only 18 years old, and uh, I, would, I was drafted. But like I said, I wasn't much on hesitating about going because I, I uh, like I said, my buddies had gone. And I had my dad, my mother, and my sister lived there, but uh, it was all right with them if I went, so, you know, not a, not a problem there. Terrific. Yeah. Well, now, after you were drafted and, and you sworn in down here, where did they send you? I went to, uh, <clears throat> I went to Fort Thomas, Kentucky for a few, two or three days, and then we rode a train for three days going to Miami Beach. I took my basic training in Miami Beach, Florida. Got down there, oh, uh, sometime around in the last of February, 1st of March. We went, well, they loaded us all over there in the yards on York Street, and we went to uh, Fort Benning, Benjamin Harrison, picked up people at nighttime in Tallahoma, Tennessee, and I woke up one morning and looked out, and I said, well, we're in Florida, there's Fort Pierce Hotel. But we still didn't know where we were going. But we ended up in Miami Beach. So uh, I was down there just a month, and took a little basic training with very little, from there I went to Shepherd Field, Texas, and then I started working on a B-29 school deal down there. And then we moved from there to uh, Salina, Kansas, uh, still with the B-29 stuff. And from there we went to Larry Field, Denver, Colorado, and with nothing to do, so I volunteered for gunnery school at that time. What, what kind of training were they giving you at these, at these different air bases? Uh, we, we weren't training. We were putting together a, B a B-29 school. In other words, we were first B-29, we had one well, of the first B-29 schools in the United States. We were training flight officers, and we put, took a cargo model of a B-24, which was a cargo C-87, and we put seven stations in the back of it to, for train flight officers for the B-29 stuff. And we had a, a fellow from California come out, his name was Guest, out of Republic Aircraft, showed how to hook up all the instruments and everything. And we went, uh, like I said, went through that, and then we moved it to, to Salina, Kansas. And then we got a B-29 out of Seattle, so they just flew it in. And then we worked on it a while up there, and, and then I got transferred up into Denver, Colorado. So then from Denver, I went to Las Vegas and Gunnery School. And then, and after gunnery, I got graduated uh, out of gunnery school and went to, to back into Tampa, Florida, and McDill Field, and we got our crew together and uh, we trained down there quite quite a bit. We got, probably got overseas uh, late in May or early in June. That was 1944. 44. And at that time we. Uh, Except the enlisted men went to a place called the Warship over there, and they, of course the uh, not, uh, the commission officers they went to another place. But all that it scuttled up was that around the Warship, uh, 
whatever you do, don't get called to the 100 bomb group. So what happened? Guy, we're all lined up one morning, and guy starts, I got your assignments here. Richardson, 100 bomb group. <laughs> now, that was the most notorious group in European theater of operation. So we started flying. My first mission was July 25th, 1944. But we trained and trained and trained and trained on an airplane when we got over there because all of the people ahead of us were flying here, here, and there, and they weren't in formations. So we had a guy by the name of uh, Colonel Jeffries. He said, fly in the morning, fly in the afternoon, train, put them wings in them fuselages, you know, get firepower. And that's what we done for a couple of weeks, and then we made our first mission. Where, where uh, you were in England at this time? Yes. Whereabouts in England? Uh, a little town called Thorpe Abbott, 90 miles north of London. We were there, uh, we got over there. Like I said, my first mission was July 25th. We went into ground support for St. Lowe for the uh, troops, and one, that's one of the blunders that's on the, on the History Channel, and we kind of messed up our own people, but it wasn't our fault. They blamed it on Omar Bradley, but who knows, you know, what happened. Tell us, tell us exactly what happened there when you were, when you were flying. Well, we come in low altitude, uh, uh, about 12,000 feet, and we, we were dropping armament and supplies and stuff to our troops down there. Well, our troops had advanced too far, and we no communications or not a lack of it, and we killed our own troops. Uh, one of the blunders, it's on, on the History Channel, I don't know if you fellas have seen that or not, but it's on the History Channel, uh, they, you know, just killed a lot of people. We went up the day before, I didn't go on that mission, but the day before they went up and they got weathered out and had to come back to England and loaded, and, and the next day was the 25th, I went on that mission, and we dropped supplies into uh, into their bombs and everything else on our own people, so that wasn't good. And, uh, and this, from there on, we flew pretty much pretty steady. Uh, this was the 25th of July, 28th and 29th of July, went to Merseburg, Germany, which is a synthetic oil plant. They had 1,100 guns on that oil plant, 88 millimeter guns. When you come out of that flak, it blocked the sun out. The black powder up there blocked the sun out. And, you know, I have a, a fellow I know up here that uh, he got shot down on that raid up here. His name's Frank Wishmeyer. Frank was in uh, Brian Belford. But anyway, I called him up and I said, Frank, I see you got shot down on the 29th of July, 1944. He said, yeah. He said, I said, what mission was that, Frank? He said, my 34th one. I said, well, that was my third one. And I said, I, we got shot up pretty good, too. He said, uh, well, yeah, I said, yeah, we had 147 holes in our airplane when we got back. He said, is that all? I said, there's no to kill it anyway. <laughs> but we went out of no brakes, no hydraulics, or nothing. Went out over a ditch and over a field and over another ditch into a tree. But then that's when we got the new airplane. We made it a reluctant dragon, so. You were flying a B-17 during the Yeah, that was a tail gunner. This mission and all, all the... Oh, everything I know was on the 17s. Okay. Yeah, and there was a uh, was training in both. Those things, but when you, uh, when you flew to the first mission to St. Lowe and to Merseburg, were yeah. there, in addition to the anti aircraft guns, were there German fighter planes? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. She, she didn't go anywhere that German fighter planes. <laughs> they were on, on this, they were constant. Uh, when we would go to the target, the P 47s would take us, escort us to the target. Well, when you get over there to target, uh, the Fort 47 would have to come back because they were low on fuel. The P-51s would come across and meet us. Now, if the 51s was 20 seconds late getting up to us, then Germans were sitting up in the clouds ready to come down and bust your rear end. So, you know, they were always doing that, you know. You know. So they, they were always around. Hey, I don't think I made a mission that I didn't see at least one. Did, did your plane come under attack by the fighters? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we never come back, I don't think, but maybe a couple times without some holes in it somewhere, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and I see these airplanes around these uh, shows now that don't have any patches on them. They didn't have any patches on them, they weren't in combat, like the old B-17s come around. But you'd get shot up pretty good. Uh, for example, my radio operator got off of that 
his chair and sat over on the camera hatch while some stuff come up through the floor and hit him on the leg, scratch his leg. But by the same token, when he got off the chair, there was a hole blowed about that big round right where his butt would have been. So, you know, <laughs> that's timing. You know? yeah, <laughs> and, uh, he's a, a Jewish fellow, okay? Nicest guy in the world. But his famous saying was, if I ever get shot down and make it to the ground, I'm going to be the fastest Jew in Germany on a bicycle. The guy said, well, where's he going to get his bicycle? I said, where's he going to steal it? Where else he going to get it? But, yeah, there's a lot of stuff going on like that. What, uh, what types of fighter planes were the most challenging uh, for? ME-109s, yeah. I run into one jet up in the North Sea, oh, getting pretty close up to the end of my missions. And I hadn't seen one before, and I was kind of banging away at one of the Two six-two German jets. And I was kind of banging away at him, and I thought I got him. He put the power on down. He went black smoke rolled out of him. Well, but that time one of nine come across my tail, and I said, "Oh God, I'm so gross to shoot at this guy." He waved at me. <laughs> I waved back at him. But he, you know, evidently he was out of ammo, or he could he could cut me right off there like nothing. You know, but he went all around the other side. But, Are you aware that the you you personally shot down any other any German? Airplane? No, no, I've got a problem. Now the guy said, "How do you get a problem?" I said, "Well, we there was a hundred people shooting at him. Who knows who got him? You know, it's one of the deal." Now my ball turret gunner got one, and my waist gunner got one. Now my waist gunner got a, ended up getting a distinguished flying cross for for his, but not only that, he went and hooked some bombs that hung up in the bomb bay with. The, to go catwalk, he walked through there with a little walk around oxygen out of a box, a bottle, and uh, he, uh, and then my radio operator held him by his parachute harness and they kicked him out over Germany, but uh, he got a distinguished flying cross. Now this Mark Foley that's on television lately, he's the one got it for him. He's a representative of Florida. You read anything about oh, Mark? Yeah, sure. Yeah, okay. He's the guy that got him booked by the same, it was a vote, vote getter deal because he, this is what's like two years, what take two years ago? Two years ago, I guess. But anyway, anyway, I went down and signed the papers in October, and they said, well, it'll be a year and a half before he gets his, let's go. This is October, January, had it. But then all the media in southern Florida, middle of Florida, was all sitting in Sharpie's front yard, wanting pick, wanting interview. He'd wake up in the morning and open the front door and he'd be sitting on his porch. <laughs> so it was Mark Foley's the guy that put that in motion. So, but it was a, it was a little political deal, I'm sure. So, which is fine. I'm glad he got it. Can you tell me a little bit about what what it was like to what you had to, to wear, what what it was like to be in the aircraft on the mission? What you had to wear? It was. Well, you had. It was so bitter cold. Okay. It, I flew at 80 degree below zero weather already. Now, you, you have, uh, put your long underwear on, and you had a heated suit, or you know, you're going to put outer, outer garments on, and then you had a heated suit, and you had heated boots, with, uh, everything was all wired, you know, so that you had boots, but you had little moccasins on underneath there. And then, <clears throat> your heated suit, then when you were flying, when you got at, uh, into the combat zone, you would put your, uh, armor vest on, and uh, it was heavy, it weighed about 45 pounds, you know, and they had a May West over that when he was over the, over the, over the water so much, but, uh, and your, your head, you know, you had your head covered up uh, with uh, a, a, a nice helmet and everything, but, and your gloves were heated, but you had silk gloves inside of them, because if you had to work on your guns or anything, if you pull your bare hand would stick right to the Right to the to the metal, see. So yeah, they, that they took care of you on that. Thank God, I didn't have to work a couple times on it. But that that worked out pretty well. And, but like I said, it, of course, you were on oxygen from 12,000 feet, 13,000 feet up. And most of my missions were anywhere from 26,000 up to 33,000 feet. Wow. Been over Berlin, 25,000 feet, 65 below zero. It was it was so bitter cold up there. It, you know, it, it was uh, <laughs> people said, "How can you operate at zero when you're that cold?" I said, 
just a little bit. <laughs> but my uh, my wires got shot out one time on my heated suit. And anyway, it kind of snuck up on me, and I was starting to get stiff, couldn't move. And I finally got my arm up on my gun uh, button, uh, radio button, told the pilot, I said, oh, free, 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 free. <laughs> he took me down to 13,000 feet, I'd been, I'd been gone, you know. It was so bitter cold. And frostbite was, you know, that was one of the big things over there was that frostbite stuff. As a, as a tail gunner. What, what position did you have to sit in to fire your weapon? You sat with your, on bicycle seat, and you had your leg right back of you all the time. And you were right here with your guns, and you, your parachute was either here or right here. Now, when I would, was in the air and would get close to enemy territory, I'd take off. I used to work at Kansas Cap, I'd take it off, take it down here. And then, when I come back out of there, I would put my stuff, I would put my flying gear on while I was in combat. And then when I, when I would come back out of the combat zone, I, I'd pick it up and put it back on. Picked up one day and the whole bill shot off of it. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, and I wired all back together and I brought it home. But what I done, I don't know. I wish I had it today. <laughs> I said, well, it's a good thing my head wasn't in there, you know. And anybody that tells you that they won't jump out of an airplane, don't know what they're saying because you will jump out of one when it's on fire. I've been ready to go more than once. We have an escape hatch in the back and you have a red hand on there and you got your hand on that hand, we're ready for the pot to tell you to go, man. But we lucky enough we got our fires out and didn't have to go. How did the fire start? Yeah, so it worked. Out. They, we, what they call that? Inboard fire extinguishers. And uh, sometimes they didn't work. Sometimes you put it in a dive, sometimes it put the wind blow them out. But most of the time, the fire extinguishers would work pretty good. So Was the fire started by any aircraft? Oh, yeah, by either German fighters or aircraft fighters. So, so. You know, the Germans, they had the, they had the uh, jets first over there. And they could only fly 20 minutes. The time they left around, they would back down. They could make one pass on you. Now, if if it would have had some oil, it would have been a different story over there for a while because them German jets were really fast. You know, they were 100 mile an hour faster than our P-51s. You know, they were, they were up on you and gone. So, you know, it just bucked out. But we mostly, not mostly, but well, about half of our missions were, if you look on that thing, they were oil, uh, synthetic oil plants. You know, like, well, you, know, you heard the guys running the Pulaski down there and stuff like that. We went to Merceburg. I had five trips to Merceburg. Like I said, they had 1,100 guns on that Merceburg. I had five trips in there. And September, when did, September, when did the Trade Center go down? 11? Yeah. 11. September 11th, 44, I went to a rural Germany. We lost 100 airmen out of my bomb group. 12 airplanes. Oh. And I'd been there two weeks before that and never got a scratch. They were waiting for us. How, how big a formation did you typically fly? Oh, sometimes you'd have three or four hundred airplanes, but ours, what our our group would try to get up, to, try to get up thirty-two, you know. Now, if you're out today and you got them pretty well shot up, didn't have it up tomorrow, you put up what you had, you know. You put up twenty or eighteen or ten or whatever you had. Now, I had already been in a, a deal where we only could put up nine. Well, then we'd go hook on with another group. Now, what we would in the mornings we would uh, we would get up, and get our breakfast, all the stuff, get our barrels and our guns, and get ready to go. And then you would the whole group would get uh, take their uh, flights to uh, White Cliff and Dover, and then you rendezvoused over there. And, you know, got your group all together, or East Anglia they call it, or White Cliff and Dover, and uh, and then you get them all, maybe maybe three or four or five hundred people. Airplanes go at one time, you know. So I, we hooked on to one group that didn't have enough, so, you know, which filled, helped fill them out because you flew, flew like this, you know, in a box. So that, that was one of the deals. But <laughs> one morning I was uh, sitting up there. My pilot would always say, you know, when you get in the air, go to take your positions and watch out for airplanes. And one morning uh, I was listening to Axis Sally music, which she played American music because. Well, it's just, you know, 
said, come on there. She said, well, good morning, Mr. Richardson. How is things in Cincinnati? I said, oh, <laughs> who are you talking to? <laughs> she said, we are waiting for you. She said, welcome to the Third Reich. And she named off our whole crew and every town that they were from. Wow. Oh, well, they had information. They had more. They had more information on us than we did. That's for sure. That's oh cool. yeah. Gosh. Yeah. Just... So the formation you flew in was called the Box. How is, yeah. How is that set up? What does that do? Uh, well, give you firepower. In other words, you can't have one here, one here without you know. When the Germans would run right in on you that way. But if you got one here shooting at them this way and one shooting at them this way, well, you know, you, they kind of backed off a little bit. Now the I flew Memphis Bell. I flew to Memphis Bell a couple times in training. Now Memphis Bell was an old F model. Now when it was flying, it didn't have any chin turn forward guns up there. Well, once they put them on, the Germans would come right in at you, you know, straight at you. And but when they put those two hundred fifties up there in that nose, it kind of deterred them a little bit from, from getting in there on you. So that's what I, I flew a G in combat. In other words, when they started out making the B-17s, they started with A, B, C, D, E, F, G. You know, G was the last model that they made. And at the end of the war, they were making 14 a day. Now you can't even find parts to put one together, but you know, they are putting four together here in the United States right now. It's, it's time. But, did, did other other types of bombers fly on missions alongside you? No, no, no. Uh, sometimes a B-24 would, would go up. Which moved. they'd go one target, we'd go to another target. <clears throat> but one time I was looking, sitting up there, <laughs> and I looked back and I said, Oh, black dots all over the sky. I said, Who? Don't want to I said, You're going to have to do something. These guys are catching us. He said, Or what do we do? I said, We'll take a little bit of action here. But when they got it, kept getting up close to us. It was the British, the only daylight made a raid that I've ever been on with them. They come up past us and went on. They, I mean, Lancasters and Halifaxes, they had a fly faster. We would. And they, they all had one bomb site. Now we, our, our box had each one laid bomb. Their had a, a bomb site. But I said, you know, British flew at nighttime, you know, and we flew at day. We flew at daytime. And you know, and we did those contour trails up there. And those Germans could take to shoot them right at us. You know. Come, I was up there one time and I see pop, pop, pop. And I said, what the devil is this kind of guy? So I told my pop, I said, you're going to have to move over here a little bit because there's a guy following us with a gun. But we had, uh, evidently he had a, a 88 millimeter on a truck on Audubon Highway down there and he, <laughs> he followed right along there. I said, you know, but we were right out of him, you know, as far as that goes. God, all them Germans, they, they were no dummies, you know. They had, they had some good. Oh, no, dummy, stupid dummy was a pepper, you know. He was a no. <laughs> like I said, if if they had had some oil, been a little tougher over there. What it was because they would send them fighters up there. How many fighters at a time did they send up after? Oh, sometimes they'd have up a hundred up there. How many? How many P-51s? Oh, protecting you? When, well, our group like. Our group would probably have six or seven as escorts, and then another another group flying over here. They probably had some too, because you know you, they couldn't cover the whole two or three couldn't cover the whole whole outfit. So. But you know, I had uh, a P fifty one was a, a really a good airplane, kind of saved our tail more than once. But, yeah, you had to have. Uh, oh, yeah. had, had, had to feel yeah. more safe. Than well, you know, when they first started flying with it, they, they were running es unescorted. Americans were losing lots and lots of people, so it, it wasn't, uh, wasn't a good thing. But when they got those, see, see the British had those Spitfires, but they couldn't cover everything either with all their stuff. But boys, I'll tell you one thing right now, if it hadn't been for America, it, London or England would have been pretty bad shape, and they were getting the heck knocked out of them anyway. So. But the Americans saved their, their rear end. Well, you, you've been on at least 33, I think you said 35 missions. Yeah. Which one of these, is, is the ruling mission the most memorable in your mind? Yeah, because like I said, we lost uh, 100 airmen and, and 
12 air, airplane about that location. When you saw a plane, one of your own bombers get hit, how many parachutes got out? Sometimes it, sometime it wouldn't be none, sometimes it would be two or three. I had a, a guy, when you get a hit, direct hit in the bomb bay, the airplane flips over on the back and breaks it too. I'm looking out the side there, and one of them flipped over and broke it too, and a guy come out like this, no parachute. Next thing you know, the parachute comes out, it's on fire. But uh, if, if you had time, when, once they start down, the centrifugal force was so bad, you know, you couldn't get your feet or nothing up part of you. Just lucky we got out of them. But I, I was up there one time and there was a guy went this way, we were going this way, and he went past, he's hollering, he's going to Sweden, or Switzerland. He bailed out his crew. We see his crew pop out. He said, I don't know if you've ever been to Switzerland or not, because Switzerland is a neutral country, see. And of all the people I've talked to in the last, I really got back into this stuff, maybe 201 or something. I didn't know it existed, but uh, I talked to one guy right field a while back. He came over by, I sat by the airplane up there, by the shoot, 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 baby. And he said, oh, I had enough of B-17. He said, oh, I want I said, well, did you fly on one a little bit? And he said, yeah. He said, I got my time in early. Got out of there. I said, well, what do you mean early? He said, I got six missions in. They went to Sweden. Hmm. When you go to Sweden, you're in neutral country. You live like kings. Americans, veg, you know. So, but he's the only one. I think I've probably talked to four or five hundred guys that flew, you know, in the last since 201, and, but he's the only one up there that I've ever talked to that interned in Sweden. Oh yeah, well, but there was a lot of them interned in Sweden because it, was, it showed some pictures of the runways with the airplanes on both sides of the runways, you know, parked. But if, if you have to go, that was a different story, but, and you could make it, that's great, but if you turn tail and go, that's not good. So, yeah, yeah. You know, so uh, you mentioned your plane had caught fire a couple of times. Oh yeah. yeah. Were there casualties uh, among the crew members? Anybody get wounded? No, 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 no. We only had two scratches. Was a guy got a scratch on his leg, and my bombardier got a scratch on his hand. Out of the 33 missions, well, actually we were in the air of 35 missions, but, but we got credit for 33. And uh, it nobody got really hurt, you know. And, but we'd fly three, four in a row, and then it would take three or four days to get three or four days off. We set two records with a 100 bomb group. We've done it in three months and 10 days, and we've done it. All nine guys started the same day, and we all finished the same day. But I had to stay, me and my Walter Gunner had to stay for instructors, gunner instructors. We were there 18 days for that, and the rest of them come home. But they're all gone now, but there's three of us left. And my navigator lives in Sacramento, California. His name is Kenny Shrewsbury. <laughs> Kenny worked for Ford Motor Company for 35 years, set up truck agencies around the country. Then he said he got tired of the shovel of snow in Detroit, so he moved to Sacramento. <clears throat> but when he left Ford Motor Company, they gave him $2 million. And he gets a new car to drive every year. Wow. We was with him in Pittsburgh, uh, September, 29th September. And he had, he had a list that they had sent him in with him to what they recommended. They used to give him the, the uh, uh, tourists all the time, but now they recommend a new fusion for him. So <laughs> that's what he was going to get. <laughs> that's pretty good, you know. Sure. <laughs> Who are the other two guys that are there? Uh, uh, Sherwood Sharp. Now he lives in uh, Port St. Louis. He's my waist gunner. He's the one who got the distinguished flying from? Yes, 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 yes. He's, uh, he's having a little bit of physical problems too, but uh, he's 83, I'm, I'm 82, and he's a little older than I am, so he's still around, and, and there's been uh, Kenny Shrewsbury out there on the coast, he's 82, so but we were like, on the average, like 23 years old, the crew, you know, uh, you know. And, and you know, and, and as I tell many people that never, have never, at no time bothered me. Now I see it on the History Channel, and I've gone there several times. Ooh, I could have got a hurt. Yes. <laughs> so, you, 
mentioned you uh, you flew three or four days and then you'd have three or four days yeah. off. What were you doing uh, when you had your free time? We'd go to London. Yeah. Yeah. Go down there, goof around the, the Piccadilly Circus, they call it. Yeah. Time. And uh, yeah, we, we would go. Uh, sometimes we didn't do it all the time. We did sometimes we just lay around the place up there. We'd they'd give you a case of shotgun shells, go out and shoot sheep and stuff like that. Practice your, you know, leading your airplanes and stuff like that. But and the poor old English guys, they had a heck of a time getting enough shells to go hunting with it. We were ever shooting, boom, boom, you know. I didn't give you a case, not a box, a case, you know. Or shoot them rascals. So uh, down London, you go out to have, have a few drinks, have dinner, go to a movie. Yeah, 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 that's all. People friendly? Yeah. I was in the Regent Palace Hotel one time when one of them buzz bombs jumped over hit the back end of it. Well, you shook that whole tub off. <laughs> but that buzz bomb was tough as Hitler had, you know. Oh, yeah. But you'd, we're right in what's called Buzz Bomb Alley, and our base was. And <laughs> you'd hear them come over at nighttime and they'd go, mm -hmm. Everybody scooped down their head. <laughs> so, where's that rascal? Boom! <laughs> Big five miles away, and just shake your tech out of the ground. You know, so. Like I well, said. Uh, a lot of people talk about the, the type of food they were served in the military. The guys in the Navy say the food was great, the guys in the Marine Corps, they didn't like it too much. How about, how about the food you uh, had? When we were flying, we had first class. We really? had, yes. We had our eggs off the stove every morning. They had a big old cook stove about that big. And you get your eggs fixed any way you want them. They had all kinds of good food. Now the ground crew, they had their own mess hall. They'd try to sneak in our mess hall because they got powdered eggs. You know, we got fresh eggs. We got everything, you know, bacon, ham, whatever you want, you know. It was, it was always, always good. I was in, a, in Savannah, Georgia here a while back and an old guy down there was narrating a little movie thing, and he said that uh, all these guys all flew from 10 to 30 below zero. I said, oh, oh well, crap. I said, I've never had a mission less than 50 below zero. And he says, yeah, well, then, then they go to get their powdered eggs. I said, never had a powdered egg in my life. And at the end of the thing, he says, well, anybody wants to know anything? Yes, that guy over there. <laughs> but he was on the ground crew with that guy. It was nice old guy. How'd you, uh, how'd you celebrate the holidays when you're away from home? You know, really a holiday to me, it still is like every other day as far as, there's not, not much difference in it. But sometimes you're flying, you know. It, it, I was on the boat coming back at Christmas time, but we had a, had a guy, well two guys, they were flying up or, or around Hamburg, and one of the guys got shot down up here, so Glenn Road Drive, pulls his plane up, takes that spot, you know, guy come down on top of him and piggybacked, and he landed that way, killed two or three people, but, uh, now Glenn just died in February of this last year, he, uh, he was the guy flying the bottom bank, but it shook the German aircraft battery up, we heard so bad that they couldn't understand an airplane with eight engines on it, <laughs> But when well, they, they crashed in Germany and they spent some time in prison camp, but uh, and somebody, a lot of people hit together. Oh, a lot of people hit together, you know. And you get up there, there's like flies out there, you know, everywhere. You know, you just pick up five, six hundred airplanes in, in one way. That's a lot of people over, you know, eight or ten mile area there, you know, to get them together to go to, to the Third Reich, you know. How close is the guy, the, 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 the plane on your right and the plane on your left when you're in that flight? They won them in that, they won them wings and then fuselage. Oh, well, they wouldn't be very far away. You, you can see if they shape or not. Three at the same height? <laughs> oh, yeah. Two, oh, yeah. But, well, you know, you're buried a little bit here and there. But, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. i tell you what, I've, I've waved at guys before they've been that close. <laughs> what the? So I close one time I was sitting back there and I heard oh, oh. guy went over the top of my tail with his Bombay doors open. He'd hit a prop horse and it flew him up over the top of me and down the other side he went and he saved, saved the airplane. Boy, he, he wasn't that far away from my tail. Oh God, he 
was I lucky on that deal. We were awful lucky. You have an escape hatch in the back of that plane then? Yeah, we did. How far from where you were sitting? <laughs> You're here, it's here. Oh, that's good. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there's a little door about this big. <laughs> uh, I tell you this, I was back there, we were in combat. Now, I don't know if you ever heard of the word chaffed or not, but anyway, it's a little aluminum strips, and they put them out in the airplane to, to, to deter the uh, uh, radar, general radar. Well, if you didn't throw it all out at one time, you'd leave it in the airplane, and then it would get wet in there, you know. And I'm back there one time, and Sharpie, he's throwing it out. There's a little tube up there. It's underneath my tail. Boom! Oh, boy. Boy. I looked down the thing. <laughs> See, I had all my parts in it. It, but them, then them, them shells would, uh, if the Germans didn't have the right altitude to go up, it could drop back down and break outside your window. It sounded like somebody throwing a handful of rocks at your airplane, you know, that's just how bad it was. What kind of protection did that glass on the back of Ford? <laughs> it wasn't no protection there, it's plexiglass and there was nothing. And now the later stuff comes up with the Lexan, but uh, ours, we got a, a seagull through our windshield down there in Florida. And he just, you know, was up training and he, he hit the seagull and just broke the windshield right out of it, you know. That old plexiglass, was, it's good for some things, but it's not good for combat because, but when they started putting the Lexan in, and there also a lot of the canopies of the uh, fighter planes were, they put all Lexan in that. But I guess it, we used to use the, the Lexan on our, we had a race car with the, for the windshield because, you know, it wouldn't break. But plexiglass or rocket hit plexiglass to go right through it. I've heard that the German fighter pilots would uh, often target the, the fellow in the tail, the gunner in the tail. Oh, yeah, they, yeah, they'd go everywhere, you know. <clears throat> you know, they, they call it, we were the bloody hunters, okay. Now, we had a tough reputation over there before I got there. They, when you surrender your airplane, you drop your wheels, and then the German fighter pilots escort you to their air base. Well, somebody says that when the Germans got up along the side of them and had their wheels down, they shot the crap out of the Germans. And then every time the, the hundreds was up, I said the rest of the outfit didn't have to worry because the, the, the uh, fighter was, <laughs> was after these square knees on the tail. So, you know, you hear all kinds of stories. I mean, how true they are, I don't know, but I've read several articles on it. And somebody says that one of the articles that the guy hit the wrong switch or something, dropped the wheels, and you know, not on purpose, but you know, just run the airplane. So who knows? You just stuff that you hear all the time. But I never really got back into this stuff. In what 201, I think it was. I I had uh, how much time we have? Oh, I think we have we have plenty of time, don't we, uh, Mr. McGee? Okay. Okay. I. I hadn't been back into this stuff at all. I, I was general carpenter for my port plant up in Batavia. And they had brought one of our work trailers out of Peoria, Illinois. Well, in this was a little phone book about this big. And in this phone book, my ball turk got lived in Kipcock, Iowa. So I looked it up at the phone number and I called him. So his wife answered the phone, but him and her were separated. And boy, she wouldn't give me no information on them at all. So anyway, I left it go, and my wife passed away, what, 11 years ago, maybe? 11 years ago. And anyway, I was going through some stuff, and I found the phone book again. So I called back out to Chica, because I thought maybe they might have got back together or something, you know. But anyway, another woman answered the phone, and she said, uh, well, who are you looking for? So I said, I'm looking for William L. Wixon. And she said, well, I got a telephone book. She said, I'll look it up. So she gave me his number. I called him, and the first words I said to him, I said, Willie? He said, Baldy, I used to keep my hair cut short. <laughs> Damn, after 45 years, 50 years, you know. I said, last time I was saying it was 1944, 45. <laughs> so, but anyway, then I got, and then I was with him, uh, her and I, her sister and me, we went to Omaha to a reunion out there. And I had uh, just had my knee redone. I was on my crutch yet, but uh, not my crutch, on cane, but. Anyway, I run into him and my waist cutter come up in Florida. And that's the first time we'd met him. And since 45. 
you know. So then we went to we went to Houston. Her and I and her sister went to Houston to go three. Went to Houston for a reunion down there, and then my navigator come for that one, and the other guys didn't show up. But then this last year we had uh, our reunion in Pittsburgh, the 29th of September through the 2nd of October. So we went to that, and my navigator showed up there, and we, we had a good time with him, you know. And uh, the other guys couldn't make it, but my ball turned cutter. I had a big picture, I still got it. I wanted him to sign it. And I went out there last October at his house in Keokuk, drove out. They hit him sign my picture and I had records with him. And his wife was at the yard sale, so, or garage sale, so I had to go to his house. But anyway, he had just come back from Iowa City and uh, he's out there for some tests. And I went back a week. He called me and said, I've got cancer of the, of the lungs. And he said, this was like in October. Well, it was the 31st of March he died, and uh, I went out to the funeral for that. And that was uh, the third, he buried him the third of April. So it's getting close. <laughs> yeah. well, you've done a good job staying in touch with uh, some of the guys that uh, yeah. you met. Oh, yeah. I, you know, I've been really enjoyed what I'm doing. I, I, I go to Wright Field a lot, and I talk to a lot of people over there, and I talk to a lot of different I've talked to the Airplane Modelers Association here in town. I, I'm going to do one for the uh, air cadets out here <laughs> any Monday night whenever I want to go do it. It's, they want me to do it for that one. And then I, we got a nice museum over there in Batavia. And I talk a lot over there to people. Uh, and uh, I've talked to some guys uh, a while back. There was two guys from England, one guy from Holland, and two guys from Canada. I talked to them all that. They were taking pictures of all of the places over there. But, this, the pictures was in that thing. My, I got a, got my uh, dragon in there, Peggy painted the dragon for me. She's a decorative painter. And, uh, so that's what we do. Well, what uh, what were you doing? Or what do you recall about the day you, you left the Air, the Air Force? Was the, was the war still going on? Or, uh, yeah, yeah, I just, you know, and I, I, I went right to work because, you know, I had worked. Uh, up when I went into service, and when I came back, my job was still there and worked greater manufacturing across the river. Well, then that went on a while, and then I, an old guy that originally started uh, the carpenter trade, or oh, early 40, probably 39 or 40, well, I was, like I said, born in 24, or uh, July uh, 7th, 24, but 3rd, uh, rather. But anyway, I started the carpenter trade with him then, and, I, and I, that's what I've been doing ever since, until I retired. Uh, 64, I think I retired, 62, something like that. And I've done a little bit of work for a super extract company for a few years. I put 22 new stores in New York, New Jersey for them. And I kind of like to keep busy, I, you know. I, uh, I don't like to, I'd like to do a whole lot, but I'd like to have something that I know I can do. Now, when we were putting in the store, she used to lay them out for me. I'd go with her, but she done the work for me. You know, I, I would, I would, I want to be there. You know, sure. if there's any decisions that we made, I made them. You know, and that was good for us. Well, is there anything I forgot to ask you, or you'd like to talk about about your combat experiences, your time in the military before we before we bring this to a close? Oh, I don't know. I, I just, uh, I like I said, I never really upset me nothing over there with that. But I know some people that lost their minds and everything else over there. But I guess maybe I was too stupid to know what the heck was going on. But anyway, it. Uh, I have a friend of mine here in town that he, his name was Jack Keller. Jack told me out of his own mouth. He says. The first mission out is Pavel got killed. The second mission out, somebody else got killed. The third mission out, somebody else got killed. So he said, I go to the chaplain, and he says, Chaplain, I said, I want to quit. The chaplain said, Yeah, I said, You can quit, but the Air Force is going to give you every dirty job that they have. So he said, He went back to flying. It took him seven crews to get in 26 missions, but he would eat his breakfast, he would up before he got to his airplane. 
so many guys look like that. Now, boy, Paul Turk got in the first mission we made. He was he got sick, and I don't think it was anything but nerves with him. And he they pulled the waist gunner, put him down there, pulled him out. But uh, you know, like I said, it, it, actually Solomon she called me that morning, and I, I said, "Lady, who are you talking to?" Now I wake up at six o'clock in the morning when you're out there. <laughs> Ronda both so, but oh yeah, I, I liked what I was doing at the time. But I knew it was better than waiting in that mud down there on the ground. I go get on that. <laughs> so, but I, I and I had I had not that I was that smart, but I had plenty of IQ. I could go to officer school, but I didn't want to do that. I, you know, I ended up doing I don't end up a staff sergeant. That's all I ended up. At. When I was flying over there, and when I drove $196 a month pay, you get so much for overseas pay, it's up 50% for flying pay, so that's enough. And he got some meals for me, you know, in a place to sleep, so it worked out pretty good. But when I had to come back, I, a lot of guys went on this Ohio 5220 stuff. I went right to work. I never did get any of that. But anyway, I, I, I'll tell you a little story here. I, one of the gals, Take care of me over to VA. I went, when I went out to, to uh, Keokuk on the 3rd of April with Mary Willie, she says, uh, You're usually here. I go for blood check on Tuesday. What happened? This is Friday. I said, Well, lady, I said, I'm out bury my ball turf cover. She said, Well, what's that? Well, my other cap, I didn't have a day, but I pulled the cap off. And I said, Now he flew this position right here. She said, What'd you do? I said, I flew that position right there. She said, well, who'd you shoot at? And this guy works for the VA, 55, 60 years old. Now that's pretty sad. And then uh, Rob Portman decorated me two or three years ago. And I was down in Savannah, and I met an old colonel down there that he goes around and he gives uh, talks to school kids, you know. And he went to this one, and this teacher introduced him to Colonel I what his last name was, sir, and so fought in World War XI. So I told Rob Portman that, and he looked at me and he said, now that is really scary. That is. You know, I, I said, why didn't you tell me what to do with number three? Yeah. <laughs> and then one of the guys would come out to the museum, 18, 17, 18 years old, one of the school kids, and she's, Bill Greenwald flies for uh, Air Death. But anyway, Bill was out there, he's going to volunteer that there, and she said, well, what's all this stuff about? He said, well, these are World War II airplanes. Well, what's that? She said. So I proceeded to tell her, you know, about what we've done. She said, Well, didn't we win? <laughs> he said, Well, we won two out of three. We tied with the third one. <laughs> you know? So that's the way it goes. But, but so many people have no idea what ever went on, you know. And it seems like it's coming back a little bit. I've got a, an interview over at Northern Kentucky University, and they have a pretty good uh, program over there. Uh, I talked to a lot of other people out to the museum too. They're kind of hooked up with the museum, but uh, it's it's been good for me. I like I said, I lost my wife 11 years ago. We married over 50 years. And, uh, I do a lot of stuff. I play a lot of golf, and I'm still pretty pretty capable of getting around. I'm still here. Well, I think it's important that you continue to stay active and continue to spread the word about what you did and your important service. Okay. During the war, I appreciate it. All right. I, I appreciate you conducting this interview today, and, and thank you for your service. You're sure you're welcome. welcome. But uh, there was times it wasn't so good, but the time wasn't so bad either. You know. So anyway, all right, guys.